welcome today. Um, I am here in Unamagi, which is uh, sometimes known as Cape Breton Island. It's part of the broader Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territories of Mi'kmaq people. And I am Marcia Ostashevsky, the director of the Sa Center for Sound Communities at Cape Breton University, where we work uh, closely together with Indigenous um, colleagues and community members to find ways of learning and listening and working respectfully towards reconciliation. And it's a great pleasure today to have a special guest speaker, Dr. Catherine Mizell. Um, Dr. Mizell is a professor of ethnomusicology at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. I always thought the name of that university sounded wonderful and joyous and so luscious. I always <laughs> imagine these, you know, amazing green lawns or something. I don't know. Then uh, Dr. Mizell earned her PhD in ethnomusicology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and also holds a doctorate in vocal performance. Her research includes topics in voice and identity, popular music and media, religion, American identities, and disability studies. And the class for which we're gathering today has read some uh, of her writing, um, her book, Idolized Music, Media, and Identity in American Idol was published in 2011. She also wrote about Idol for the magazine Slate from 2007 to 2011. The Oxford Handbook of Voice Studies, which she co-edited with Nina Eidsheim, was published in 2019. And her monograph, Dr. Mizell's monograph, Multivocality, Singing on the Borders of Identity, was published in early 2020. And I just like also to acknowledge that this um, won an award from the Society for Ethnomusicology. And and uh, Dr. Mizell, can you tell us briefly about that? Because uh, the last speaker also, Dr. Alicia Lola Jones, her book oh, also yeah. won a similar <laughs> award, right? So just to kind of provide some more education for the students. Uh, right. Um, so uh, Dr. Jones won the... Um, Ruth Stone Award, yeah. I think that's what it what's called now. Yes, and uh, that is for the for an author's first book. Um, and uh, Maureen Mayon won the Merriam Prize, which is for an author's second or further book. Um, and then I was just an honorable mention. So it's not, not just really an honorable mention. I sit on those prize committees. Okay. And the competition is stiff, and you don't have to give honorable mentions. It means well, you really want to give this one a prize too. But right, I am <laughs> honored. Yes, thank it you. It's a big honor. <laughs> so absolutely. So um, without any further delay, I ask the students of the Human Voice class and any uh, guests who are joining us today to please join me. Uh, and Eric, who is supporting us um, technically from the Center of Sound Communities, to join me in welcoming Dr. Mizell, who is going to speak to us today about singing in the hearing and deaf borderlands. Thank you, Dr. Mizell, for joining <laughs> us. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Ostashevsky um, for inviting me and to uh, Eric for running everything technically. Um, so as Dr. Ostashevsky said, I am coming to you from Bowling Green, Ohio. Um, and uh, this is land that was historically um, held by many different groups of people, actually um, sort of waves of different peoples, uh, but most recently uh, Delaware, Miami, Ottawa, Seneca, and Wyandot or Wendat people uh, who were then forcibly displaced from their land by the U.S. government. And um, as you know, land acknowledgments like this are are a part of raising the awareness of the continuing impact of colonization, but they certainly are not the end of any kind of reconciliation or decolonization efforts. Um, so uh, the, the chapter that you read for today was part of my book, Multivocality, and I have just a little introduction that I wanted to give you to that book. Um, so you have sort of the context. Um, and then I'll show you some videos that are related to the chapter you read, and then we can have a discussion. So um, I do want to point out that classes like this, I'm, I'm so excited that you get to take this class. Um, 
classes like this, you know, seminars are a place where your faculty often kind of work out things that are issues and ideas that they're going to make into a book. And um, and I, I have to say that this that the book, Multivocality, it really did start um, out of both the book that I did before, but also a seminar that I taught on voice. I think I taught it like three times. Um, and all of the things that, that kind of came up in those classes really helped to, helped me to formulate the way that I was thinking about voice. So, and as you know, from all of your other guests and all of your reading, there are many ways to think about voice. Um, and uh, and I, I'm just presenting one way, right? One person's way. So hopefully some of it will resonate with you a little bit. Um, so, okay. So I wrote the book, Multivocality, for two main reasons. One, I was a singer for a really long time, really long time. <laughs> and two, I couldn't sing anymore. Um, after a worsening of health issues in graduate school that made singing a constant fight for control over an uncooperative body, I told my instructor that I would stop singing for a while. Taken aback, she warned me, you won't feel like yourself. And she was right. It wasn't like I'd lost a skill or a hobby, but like I'd lost my entire knowledge of who I was, like I'd lost my place in the world and my way of being in it. I was lucky to find something else I loved in ethnomusicology, but that shift to saying I used to be a singer continued to mark and continues to mark the most wrenching loss of the many that can accompany chronic illness and disability. So my desire to research voice and identity was in part driven by a need to understand my own experience um, and, and to answer that question, you know, why why was this so traumatic for me? Uh, I can still speak, you know, I haven't lost my voice entirely or anything like that. It's just the being a singer part that's gone. Um, so the more I studied ethnomusicology, the more I began to understand that my identity as a singer was always more a cultural one than either an essential or occupational one. I was a conservatory voice major through two degrees and a university voice major through a third, and I taught singing for more than 15 years. Singing is an intensely personal, but also exquisitely intersubjective act. Western classical voice discourse, which is what you get if you study in a conservatory or a university, um, positions voice as an experience of unique selfness. But that discourse itself represents a specific singing culture, the one made up of opera and art song, of voice science and pedagogy, of airheaded soprano jokes and cutthroat competition in a nearly vanished market. It's a culture that in my lifetime has been shaped by and entangled in the same threads of individualism and neoliberal capitalism that are currently forcing the US and pretty much every other country that's involved in global neoliberal capitalism uh, toward some kind of new reckoning. Um, and I had lost that culture. I was unmoored and adrift somewhere in between. And in my work, I have found that voice is really all about in-betweenness. Martha Feldman observes that voices tend to exist, quote, in the interstices of encounters, the spaces of transition, the spaces in between, end quote. At once, delineating and mitigating the internal external borders of the body as it sounds, and working similarly across the geographical and ideological borders of cultural spaces, voices make exquisitely valuable instruments of debordering and rebordering, of border dwelling and border crossing. They do not merely exist in interstitial spaces. They help to create, recreate, and reshape the spaces in which they resonate, intertwined with the construction of bodies, identities, and relationships. And the need to voice border experiences can generate singers. At the same time I was feeling lost, I was also thrilled to watch several of my conservatory classmates become commercially successful singers, not in opera as we'd all been trained, um, but in multiple genres and styles such as classical crossover, a combination of operatic and pop repertoire, um, folk music, practices and ideas whose popularity peaked first in the 90s and then in the mid to late 2000s. I saw that they frequently changed their technique and their sonic modes according to the contextual demands of the music they sang. 
that means the cultural context. And, and I wondered if, despite pedagogical discourse that assigned to each singer a singular, authentic voice, whether this was something 21st, sing, 21st century singers had to do to make a living, uh, to use multiple voices. I had previous, previously written about voice and the marketing of identity in the singing competition, American Idol. So it was not a big leap to begin to put these themes together, to study how a singer's sound figures in their ontology and epistemology of self, right? Their knowledge of being and their knowledge of knowledge um, of who they are. And uh, to study how strategies of sonic identity work in the navigation of the many kinds of borders that singers cross. Um, and the more I learned, the more I began to see that voices are shaped more by choices than we often acknowledge. Choices that are made by all kinds of singers everywhere that can be at once shaped by and resistant to the idea of the neoliberal subject. And the neoliberal subject is this idea that you as a person um, are something marketable, right? And that is a core aspect of your identity is like how you can sell yourself to be successful. Um, so I wanted to know about why and how singers change their ways of singing. Um, and if I wanted to know that, first I needed to theorize what a way of singing is. And I started by considering the concept of vocality and how it's been used across disciplines. Singing, which is again always intersubjective and culturally shaped, may be considered a social practice of being in the world, that's after Heidegger, uh, of acting in the world that is a kind of agency, right? Um, and in 1966, avant-garde composer and singer Kathy Barbarian linked this function with the idea of vocality as she encouraged singers, classical singers, to develop a collectively new vocality by exploring many ways of singing, using a wider range of vocal qualities and capabilities as what she calls ways of being for the voice. Um, I have argued that singers frequently find multiple ways of being and acting in the world through voice and that they, that they apply the inherent intersubjectivity and interstitiality of voice to navigate the in-betweens and border crossings of 21st century identities. In my research, I've explored intersections of culture and consciousness, the material and the metaphorical in the vocal navigation of identity. I think about voice as physiological and agentive, as both personal and cultural. As I study vocalities with the view that they are vocal ways of being, I aim to position sounds, practices, techniques, and meanings in the context of the truths singers experience and in the complicated epistemologies of voice that mirror and shape both self and culture in discrete and overlapping ways, both discrete and overlapping ways. And as I have suggested that, uh, I have suggested that when singers perform across borders mapped between styles, genres, spaces, cultures, and temporalities, they are performing not only in multiple vocalities, but more importantly, they are performing multivocality in the process of self-making. So the chapter you read for today, focuses on singers who navigate cultural borders marked in large part by the specific ways bodies are involved in language. And I wanna reiterate that my work wasn't done in the context of deaf studies itself, though it certainly intersects with that field. It's instead about several individuals who came to um, deafness and to a relationship with deaf identity after growing up with enough hearing to be part of hearing culture um, and enough hearing really to become a singer first. Um, so, and these strategies they work that, that they employ to navigate hearing and deaf cultures um, work for singers in different ways, as you read. So, um, let me put up my slides. Hold on a second. Nope. Share. Sorry. I was just saying. Um, it's been an entire semester since I've taught on Zoom, so I've forgotten how to use it. Hang on one second. Share screen. Okay. Uh, screen. Got it. All right. So this is what I was just telling you about um, this idea that vocality is something that I see as a way of being in relation to voice. Uh, that it can involve specific sounds and practices and techniques and meanings and power structures that are particular to a cultural context. 
And then I'm looking at multivocality as the use of multiple vocalities to navigate identity, especially across any kind of borders, but especially cultural borders. Um, okay. Um, so sound. Um, you may know this already, but I just want to reiterate. Um, sound is a disturbance in the air. Um, and the kinds of sounds that we hear as tones or that we interpret as tones, if our hearing is typical, um, is sounds that have uh, that have a pressure wave that um, that is even that it is uh, it is repetitive in the same way right the same amplitude and the same um, frequency and uh, sounds that that aren't even that aren't regular like this uh, we tend to hear as noise um, but a sound is a disturbance in the air that, that is a pressure wave so it's air pressure going in and I keep doing this with my hand but that's because <laughs> um, this is how the sound approaches our ears right um, and again if we have typical hearing then that sound, um, sorry, <laughs> that sound um, is translated uh, into trans uh, transitions to the eardrum or the tympanic membrane, which vibrates. And then that vibration is, uh, and it vibrates the same way that the pressure wave does in and out. And then that vibration is translated into and transferred to the cochlea, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment. Um, and then from there, it is translated into uh, electronic or neurological signals that go to your brain. And our brains interpret sounds both in physiological and in cultural ways. So, um, and if you want to do more reading on that, um, Anina Fales, Cornelia Fales, has done amazing, amazing work on, on the ways that we interpret what we hear. So um, just to give you a I think this is actually, yeah, okay. Just to give you a little visual, right? So the sound waves come in here. Um, and then here's the tympanic membrane. Can you see my cursor? I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you can. Yes? Okay, yeah. And then uh, that is transmitted through the auditory bones here. Um, you have semicircular canals here into the cochlea and that there it's translated into signals that can go to your brain. Um, and so it's a really, really complicated and delicate process. It's, it's really amazing um, when it works typically. Uh, but, but because it's so delicate and because it's so complicated, any number of things can, um, can interrupt the process of hearing sound or interpreting sound. Um, and what happens in your brain as you interpret sound, like there's particular parts of your brain that are involved in interpreting sound. There's actually multiple parts of your brain that are involved in it, but it's the same parts. Um, there, there have been some studies that, recent studies that suggest that for deaf people, um, when, when they um, feel sound um, instead of hearing it, right, uh, when they use touch to interpret sound and experience sound, the same parts of their brain are involved. So there's something about interpreting sound and, and experiencing sound that, that is involved in particular parts of our brain. Um, so that's what's going on. And, um, and if, you have, um, if you have some part of your hearing process that is not typical, um, that can lead to either loss of hearing if you have hearing to begin with, or it can lead to, um, can lead to what's called profound deafness, where you really have an extremely limited range of frequencies that you can perceive. Um, and, and just to be clear, like in the, in the cochlea, I can't remember if I took this out or not. Yes. Okay. In the cochlea, which is now it's turned on its side in this picture, um, the, you, it's filled with fluid and then also it's lined with these tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, hair cells that are called cilia. And the ones that are closer to the outside of the ear are the most sensitive. Uh, so they pick up the, the, the widest range of frequencies and, um, and this especially high frequencies. And because they are kind of more, they're more exposed um, and because they're on, on the outside, they're closer to the opening of the ear, um, any kind of extremely loud sound, um, you know, huge amplitude is going to damage them. And so if you have typical hearing and you lose some of it, it's likely 
um, that the first things that you'll lose are the cilia that interpret uh, the very, very high pitches. So like my dad is 83 and he is uh, losing his hearing. And the first thing that he hasn't been able to hear is high high pitches. And he complains all the time that he can't hear me because my voice is high. <laughs> so um, he has hearing aids that, that he uses. Um, but also Dr. Ostashevsky and I, I mean, if, if any of you in the class are under 30, um, you can hear frequencies that Dr. Ostashevsky and I cannot um, just automatically as you age, you lose some of those um, those little cilia. So I just wanted to point that out. It's not really like directly relevant to the chapter you read, but um, but it's something that um, that happens to pretty much everybody, right? That your hearing doesn't stay the same throughout your life is what I wanted to point out. So um, and studying uh, the way that hearing and sound are uh, interact in the way that they're that they're experienced by people reminds us that there are multiple ways of hearing, right? Not just through the ear, um, but there are other ways of experiencing sound. So, um, right. So you uh, read this chapter that involved three particular singers um, who I had talk to as part of my research. And uh, the first, oh, sorry, I meant to say this part, I forgot this part. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, in my in my chapter, as you read, um, I'm using the small d audio logic to enter, sorry, to um, refer to the, I, the situation of audiologically, audiological deafness, okay, I need a vacation. Um, and the capital D, which is associated conventionally now with deaf identity um, or deaf culture, um, which is a more recent concept from the late 20th century. And um, just to, to point out, as I do in the chapter, that there are also other ways of being like hard of hearing. Hard of hearing usually uh, describes people who have a degree of deafness audiologically who may primarily or exclusively use spoken language in their lives. Um, and then there's also this idea um, that is quite recent that deafness can have this capital F, um, which describes a capital D and a capital F, right? Describing a cultural position that's neither fully grounded in deaf culture nor in hearing culture, but as McElroy and Storbeck write, quote, represents the cultural space from which um, deaf, deaf, or hard of hearing individuals transition within and between the deaf community and the hearing community. Okay, now, so you read about uh, these three singers, and uh, one of them was Mandy Harvey, and um, she she's done an awful lot of work since since I was since I talked to her, which I think was in like 2014, so it takes a really long time to get a book done. Um, it really it took me like nine years to get that book done. <laughs> so um, in any case, uh, maybe it was 2015 I talked to her. Anyway, after that, she after I talked to her, she was on America's Got Talent uh, in like 2017 or something, 2018. And she, she talked a lot about her experience on that show as well. And um, and it, it's really kind of fascinating. So I'm going to give you two examples. Um, one is from her 2013 performance at the Kennedy Center as part of um, what is what has been shortened to the Very Special Arts Program, um, which is a problematic name, but um, does do a lot to support disabled artists. And um, so you read about this performance, and I want you to just notice that she is not wearing shoes or socks. Actually, she has bare feet. And as she said in um, in our interview, uh, she does that so that she can feel um, what's going on in the percussion and sometimes the bass so she knows where she is in the music. Oh, I need to share sound. Hold on. Okay, I am music when I look at you. The beautiful theme of every dream I ever knew Down deep in my heart, I hear it play I felt it start and melt away I hear music when I touch your hand A beautiful rhapsody from some enchanted land Down deep in my heart, I hear it sing
say is that the day I alone have felt this lovely strain I alone have felt this glad refrain Must it be forever inside of me? Why can't I let it go? Why can't I let you know? Why can't I let you know the song my heart would sing? A beautiful melody of love, youth, spring. The music is sweet, the words are true. The song is you. Hey, and um, so at this point, uh, this is very close to when she um, became profoundly deaf um, and she had to uh, drop out of her music education program where she was going to do vocal um, choral music and uh, and so she had learned some ASL um, American Sign Language while she was younger because she had continuing hearing problems she has um, she talked about this after um, she was on America's Got Talent, um, but she she has a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, uh, which I also have, though it has not affected my hearing. Um, and it's quite common, but isn't commonly diagnosed, I guess you could say. Um, but she, uh, in this performance, is using what's called SIMCOM or simultaneous communication, which is where she's signing in a way that like directly word for word um, translates English into signs, but it's not ASL, right? It's not actually the language. It's um, It does help people who sign to understand what's going on, but it's not done uh, in a poetic way or in a way that even conforms to the grammar in ASL. When she was on America's Got Talent, um, here she is also not wearing shoes, but, but yes, wearing stockings. <laughs> and um, uh, she started, by the time she was on America's Got Talent, she had started performing in ways that, um, that more aligned with ASL rather than SimCom. And just, I'll just give you a tiny bit of this and we'll go to the next one. <laughs> This is a song she wrote. I have something to say to you And it's just, it's just too little, too late It's time that we will face the truth It's time we go our separate ways don't know how everything got confused Can't explain the mess that we made Or release me Please release me Oh please let me go So, um, so in that performance, I don't know if you noticed, but you know, she, so she repeats while she's singing this phrase, release me, and she actually performs it in ASL in multiple ways. So there are actually multiple signs for the same thing, um, which is much more common in song signing um, in deaf culture. So an interpretation, right? So it, it's not just, she's not just translating things word for word the way she was in the first time. Um, Right. 
Okay. Um, you also read about T.L. Forsberg, um, who is now um, a playwright, and I think she just won an award for a work she did at a Fringe Festival in Los Angeles. And uh, she's also been on television multiple times as an actress. And um, this is just a tiny clip from the film that she was in in 2010, see what I'm saying, uh, where she is in a vo vocal lesson. Um, and both she and Mandy Harvey um, use technological assistance for making sure that when they practice, they are able to um, stay in tune. And that's Mandy Harvey with a tuner app. Um, and this is, this is T.L. Forsberg using a more complicated device. 10 years earlier. <laughs> muscle memory. I have to repeat it a lot. I'm so lost. Just let me be loved. Yeah. Alone. All you have to do is just listen really hard and repeat the words, okay? Okay. The dog came home at last. She's paying for her bread. I missed it. Am I supposed to guess? Just kind of like life. Just have to fill in the blank all the time. Sex. The problem is that he got really good at filling in the blanks. That boy man, the man that brought the to me, it's not like money, but I figured out it was probably mail. So it seems like that. That's okay. I mean, I guess you eventually get the information. It's just a little exhausting. Okay, we're done. Thank you. Um, you failed every condition. So quiet, noise in both ears, noise in right, and noise in left. You failed every condition. On any given moment, I can sit here and have a conversation with you and feel com almost completely hearing. I can get everything, and then all of a sudden you insert a certain circumstance. And it's like, blah, blah, blah. the world is mumbly. I lost my caring when I was eight and a half. I was never really viewed as deaf or hard of hearing. I was just a hearing kid who had some problems with her ears. I want my hearing so I can sing, but I don't want to lose it. She's um, lip syncing here to her own voice. So um, in the chapter you read about uh, how she talks about her, uh, her signing style at this point in her career. Uh, which she describes as epic. <laughs> so um, it's also not necessarily super typical um, song signing, but um, she really she really worked on it for a number of years as well. Um, and but it was very hard for her to sing and do that kind of signing at the same time. So she ended up lip syncing to her own voice and then signing it at the same time. Um, and then uh, finally, um, I won't show you this whole thing, but it's just a little bit uh, with Janine Roebuck, who is an opera singer um, in the UK. And uh, she was on this program, See Here, which is a BBC program for deaf people and, um, and anyone else who is interested in 
British Sign Language. So you won't see ASL in this, um, but, but BSL, British Sign Language. Um, and um, yeah, I think this is, this is a really fascinating clip, which I may have to fast forward a little bit. I'm sorry, it's a little quiet. Now for an interesting and uplifting story. Opera singer Janine Roebuck tells us that if you have ability, passion and determination, there's no limit to what you can achieve. Um, apologies for the orientalism. For several years, Janine Roebuck has been one of the UK's leading mezzo-soprano opera singers and today continues to enjoy a career which has taken her talents all over the world. Yet for much of this time, she managed to keep a secret from her fellow professionals. As a teenager, Janine was diagnosed with the condition progressive nerve deafness, which has led to a gradual decline in her hearing. It was devastating to be told that um, with my, the hearing loss that I had, I would never be able to have a professional career as a singer because that's all I'd ever wanted to do since the age of about two when I was dressing up in front of mum's mirror, you know, and singing to myself. So it was quite heartbreaking. I inherited the progressive nerve deafness from my father's side of the family and it goes back generations, many generations. In my case, it didn't start to manifest itself till I was about 18 at university. But my mother tested me when I was very young. She dropped a heavy tray behind me and I jumped right up to the ceiling with terror, really. Um, but she was very relieved because, oh, good, there's nothing wrong with the hearing then. But she hadn't realized that it, it didn't start till much later and then spiraled downwards from there on. Well, I was singing in the university opera group um, and the professor of audiology happened to be the, the director of the opera, The Magic Flute, that I was working on. and. Um, he very kindly tested me and my father. Just uh, they were interested in the, the, the um, genetic um, history. And um, a couple of days later, I met him on campus, and he was um, wreathed in smiles, which is something that always sticks in my mind as being um, inappropriate. And said, um, "Oh well, of course, with with your um, the severity of your hearing loss, there's absolutely no way you will ever be able to have a career in music." So. You're just going to have to keep it as a hobby. And I inappropriately smiled back and said, oh, thank you very much. And then went home and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. I instinctively and automatically developed coping strategies. I lip read predominantly all the time. If I didn't see your lips, I wouldn't know what you were saying. That develops the, the, the visual, of course, for me is very important, watching the conductor watching colleagues when they're breathing in, so I'm coming in with them at the same time. I've also developed my sixth sense is very strong. My intuitive side is very strong. You know, I can walk into a room and say, <sighs> you know, so-and-so was really angry, weren't they? And they, everybody else says, were they? I didn't notice. You know, so you need as many clues coming to you from your other senses as possible. Um, before I got the hearing aids, I'm thinking to myself, God, you know, I've really got to give this up now it's getting impossible and then I've given a better hearing aid and that keeps me going so hearing aids are vital and not only the quality of the hearing aid but also the the expertise of the, the technician who is fitting you the technology of, of, of hearing aids is just phenomenal and it's just going to get better and better and better so from that point of view I don't really have any concerns I already know of the next hearing aid the power hearing aid I need to go on to next and that's waiting there for me so that's quite a nice comforting feeling. So I'm going to skip ahead. I was very fortunate. Um, just a little bit. Um, so her voice teacher, um, her vocal coach, has some things to say uh, about her work as well. Um, that wasn't in the public domain at the time. And I think she, she didn't need to make it. He didn't it know she was deaf, is what he's saying. She was, it, it was all working fine. And she wasn't as deaf, perhaps, as she is now. What did you feel you did? Well, I just, I just relaxed a lot more. And, and by relaxing that, it released the yeah. diaphragm as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't have to go whoop 
Yeah. But just, just make sure that you're not holding at the end of your phrases. I've learned as much probably working with Janine as, as she has from, from me, you know. Because when I started with Janine, she was then an accomplished singer and uh, a name uh, in the opera world. So therefore, I wasn't going to insult her to teach her to sing. It was how I could best maximize her, her talent. I think Janine has a, has a great voice. It's very warm, it's got a good range to it. Um, I mean, she goes, can go very high and she has a good lower um, range to her sound. It carries very well in an auditorium. She's a very good performer, a very good communicator. And I think these days you have to have the whole package. Again, keep breathing, keep breathing. Lock. Yeah, you do, yeah. At the end of your phrases, then you're locking. Opera singers, um, the sound, you, you are inside and you have no real idea of how the sound is projecting out into the auditorium or, or into the opera house. So therefore, even as a hearing person, it's all about the feel because you don't have a concept of how that voice is traveling correctly into the auditorium. Because if you're changing acoustic all the time and you're going from a dry acoustic like a studio or a cathedral or um, a, rec um, a concert hall or an opera stage, all those acoustics are different. So if you go by sound, you've had it. Okay, so um, that's just to orient you all to the chapter that you read. Um, and, <laughs> okay, so maybe I can ask um, how many of you are singers at all? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure that anyone in this class identifies as a singer, though I know some identify <laughs> as musicians um, uh, because we come from all these different uh, oh, disciplines, I guess, right? Like but I I'm glad. Something. Oh, good, yes, Charlie. Okay, good. <laughs> good. I like to sing, Hugh says, but it's up to other people if they call it that. <laughs> I would say you're a singer, yeah, for sure. Um, there's no rules that <laughs> you know about who gets to be a singer or who doesn't. Um, so... Wonderful. Do you have particular questions that you brought to class um, having to do with anything that you read or, or questions that came up while we were, while I was talking or showing videos? Uh, what's the hardest genre? Asked, what is the hardest genre to sing when sonically impaired? What would the reward be for singing when sonically impaired? I don't know if I can, you know, pinpoint what the hardest genre to sing would be in any um, in any kind of useful way. I, I think that probably is individual. Um, I think, I mean, I think if you're singing opera or if you're singing and you're classically trained, there's a lot of um, that feeling that they're talking about. Um, there's a lot of discussion about placement of the sound, which can be problematic, but um, there's so much discourse about it. And there's so much sort of like sense inside. Um, one, of the, one of the most disruptive things that singers do, um, even when they are hearing, when they have typical hearing, is to um, place the sound like, or feel the sound so much inside that it just can't get out and a lot of choral singers do this because they're trying to hear how they sound in a mess of of other voices um and so you get kind of like the Ooh, right <laughs> and the sound where people are sort of keeping it side it doesn't it doesn't go very far um but you can do that in classical singing in other forms of singing that are more that are closer to speech i would say it's probably harder to do that but i'm not sure that it's really helpful in classical music either it's just maybe a coping mechanism. Um, sorry, so uh, Mary and then Jennifer. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, um, a comment and a question. When, um, well, within the, the chapter and um, today, when you're speaking about Mandy Harvey, that kind of struck a, a chord with me. Uh, a number of years ago, I studied music at Acadia University, and I was studying percussion under Mark Adams, mm -hmm. and he himself, and he encouraged us as the students to perform without shoes. Um, oh. He wanted us to become accustomed to feeling the vibrations that both we were creating 
and that uh, and that the other performers were creating around us and to incorporate that into how we performed in our interpretation of the performance. So that was that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and the question I had um, where uh, you spoke about uh, losing the ability to sing, um, where you're still within the music world as an ethnomusicologist um, and you you express that you still have have ties. Um, do you feel that you also exist within a similar borderland to uh, the singers that you uh, that you've just talked about? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I, the last chapter of my book is about voice loss. Um, it's not all about me, but I'm in there. Um, and and definitely, I, I definitely it's some kind of borderland. Um, and and I think part you know the frame of my book um, in in terms of looking at singers as neoliberal subjects, right? Um, it, part of part of this borderland that I am experiencing, not singing anymore, um, is is in that context um, because you're not really allowed to do multiple things, um, you know. In in the I mean, it's not that different in Canada, but at least in the U.S., right? We're not. You can't have like you can't be an ethnomusicologist and like a singer in the sense that like here in my university, um, in my college of music, um, I'm an ethnomusicologist and like, like the voice faculty, they're nice and everything, but like, I'm not part of their world. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, they're, they're not really interested in what I'm writing or anything like that. And, um, so yeah, you kind of like lose this singer culture, I think. And whenever I meet anybody who like likes singing, I feel an instant kinship with them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I would say definitely I'm navigating that always. Um, if I may jump in, uh, one of the things that Canadian ethnomusicologists are known for is more of a blending of the practice and ah. And for theory, um, uh, and I was trained as an opera singer too, and performed for many, many years, and then and, and also as a professional dancer. So, um, but I certainly, it's it's also true that each of these things takes so much time to do at a professional level that we can't do them all equally. Um, but for instance, there are ways in which you, as I, for example, find, you know, to weave into it. So for example, I'm a cantor in the Byzantine Ukrainian church here. When we do projects that have to do with songs and stories, or um, I, I will perform sometimes, right? So I know there, there are uh, different ways of finding such balance. And also, or balance is not the word, right? Just finding different channels, I guess, of expression or or really ways of being more broadly. Um, and also, I really also feel like I lo like a part of myself is gone is, or has died. It's really it's, common. It's, yeah, it's, it's really common. Off. It's it's not. Oh, it's you know. Oh yeah, I like I like to do this. It's this is the way I am in the world. And when you're not that so much anymore, like it's really everything about how you feel and sense the, how you are on the earth and through the space that, it, you know, is around you every day, everything changes. Yeah, I think that most musicians feel that pretty acutely. You know, um, most of us who go into music, we go into music because we can't not, right? It's like, it's not just something we like. It's, it is, like you said, it's our whole um, being. And, uh, and so when you go into academics in, um, in music, that can be a response that you have. Um, and I know also, you know, lots of things can happen throughout your life that take you away from practicing the way that you used to um, a lot of them have to do with disability and aging and, and things like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's good to keep this in mind that, you know, when you, if you feel devastated, it's because you're not just losing like the ability to do a thing, right? It's, it's your whole uh, existence that's sort of in question, right? Um, Jennifer, you've had your hand up, sorry. 
Oh, no, that's okay. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank you for, for being so open and honest with us about um, your own personal experiences and feelings. Um, I just want to put that out there before my question. Um, so kind of what we've been discussing, um, I kind of thought of the question about has resources for um, deaf individuals um, hoping to learn how to sing or gain access to the performing industry been growing in recent years, or is it still a challenge that these individuals are facing? I mean, I don't think there's, I, I, I'm not like directly in the voice world at the moment, but I don't, I haven't really seen anything growing in like vocal pedagogy. Um, so you know the way that like, maybe someone else who's a singer might have a, a different answer, but you know the way that in the past few years, there's been more interest among voice pedagogues in um, like figuring out um, what pedagogies work best um, with with trans individuals, um, and and there's you know I think there's now a book or two about um, the trans voice in singing. I mean, trans voices in singing, not the trans voice. Um, and but I haven't seen anything like that for for deaf singers. I think it's more like a kind of trial and error. It seems like um, I don't. I don't know anybody who is, you know, specifically works with deaf singers. Um, but if there are any singers here who, who have seen otherwise, please do chime in. That raises a, a good point. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and for acknowledging the uh, very open ways and generous ways in which Dr. Mizell is sharing with us in the book and in, in today's presentation. Um, uh, Bethany Schuyler posted a question and then we'll go to you. The question from Schuyler is, what are some of the subtle nuances signing uses to convey the sonic and emotional complexities of singing? And as a side note, he says, I've always performed without shoes as well, but never thought That's of great. a fly <laughs> until now. So that resonates with you. <laughs> okay, That's great. Uh, right. So, so there are a lot of, um, for for interpreters right who specialize in signing for singer uh, sorry signing for singers interpreting for um, deaf audience members there are a number of different um, strategies that that they tend to use and everybody also can be individual there but i think um you read in the chapter a little bit about some of the maybe more problematic issues um, that come up and this has been talked about recently in public discourse about uh, interpreters who sign for um, like rappers, right, who sign for hip hop artists. Um, and and usually it's a white interpreter um, signing for, often it's a white um, woman interpreter signing for um, a black man um, who's the rapper. And there are issues that come up in terms of um, body language because um, interpreting isn't just about words. Um, right, and ASL isn't just about words. There's grammar in the face and and in the body, and so um, so there are issues of representation, um, race and ethnicity, and gender that come up um, in interpreting. But um, there are you know everybody who does it has to figure out how to represent the character and qualities um, and and even sometimes the specific vocal practices that a singer might be using um, like vibrato or like um, or like melisma right I'm doing what they call runs um, what singers call runs right um, and uh, and so so the question doesn't have like a definite answer but um, there uh, you know, when I was talking to TL, she discussed interpreting for singers at um, at her church that she interprets for, um, and she has also sung there and signed there. And um, but she talked about interpreting for um, a duo uh, where one singer was white and one singer was black, and she she talked about this snap that she used. I think that's in the chapter, um, and how that is associated with. Um, with uh, black culture and also with gay culture and the church that she is interpreting for is an LGBTQ church. So um, there are all kinds of things you can say about that. Um, my tutor, uh, when I was taking ASL, 
um, told me that because she interprets for musical theater um, quite a lot. Um, and she told me that she also, um, she identifies as, as Latina. And she said that when it's a Latinx or Latinx singer, um, she feels like she has to put something else in her body, right, that indicates that. Um, so those are some of the complexities that, that have come up, if that answers your question. Such detailed and deep, deep insights. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this with us. Um, Bethany, did you want to share your, your question now? Yeah. Um, hi, my question was just about how you commented on when um, hard of hearing singers do sign language. It's not ASL language. It's just like to go with the singing. I was just wondering, is that like a whole language of its own, like a subcategory of signing or like something that can be taught? Yes. So, um, so only some singers do that. So Mandy Harvey, like I said, was doing that in the beginning, but no longer does that. So she was using this um, practice called SIMCOM, simultaneous communication, which comes from um, deaf education, actually. And it comes from oralism. So it's something that um, like the idea that deaf people should speak. And this is the cause of an enormous amount of, um, of pressure and oppression, really, of deaf children um, for centuries in school. Like there, there's been this tension for, um, you know, since the 19th century about whether deaf children should be forced to speak um, using, using vocal sound um, or whether they should be taught in, um, in a sign language. And this is all over the world, like in places that have been colonized and also in um, European countries and in North America. Um, it's, it, there's actually quite some similarity to the way that, um, that Native American First Nations children um, have been you know, taught in, in ways that suppress their culture, right? In ways that cultures, in ways that suppress their, um, their way of being in the world. Um, and so for um, SIMCOM was developed to help with a translation to English because um, in, let's take ASL as an example. ASL is actually completely separate language from English. It's not a translation of English. ASL is a language. And when children go to school and they learn both ASL and English, like they learn to write in English, but they learn to communicate in ASL, they're learning two different languages, right? They're learning, um, you know, how, how to um, communicate with other people in ASL, but then when they write, they're learning English, and the grammar is completely different. Partly because ASL was um, founded, it was it's grounded in a French system, so there's like a French element to that, and then also all of these specific um, grammars and uh, syntaxes that grew up like in the United States um, for for ASL. So. Um, so SimCom is a way of kind of like bridging the gap, um, and it was developed to help children make that sort of transition between ASL and English. Um, but deaf people with a capital D who are culturally deaf um, don't consider SimCom a language. It's not a language in itself. It's just a um, pedagogical technique, um, and it's it's just sort of like if you're just learning ASL, it's probably the easiest. Thing to do. If you're just learning signs, it's probably the easiest thing to do if you're interpreting a song, but it won't, um, it's not like people won't get it um, if they, not, not like deaf people won't get it if they see you doing SimCom, but it's not going to be, um, it's not the same thing as language, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I know you're going to have to pop off soon. Um, uh, thank you for your question, Bethany. I do have a few minutes. <laughs> Good. Okay. We do have uh, one more question from Hannah, who's writing actually about singers for her big research project. Wonderful. Uh, so, so thanks um, for taking this one more question. You mentioned in Mandy Harvey's performance that she used repetition in her performance. Is there importance in repetition for ASL users or any difficulties? Also, I think the use of no shoes is really interesting as I teach dance and get my dancers to dance with no shoes and no music to teach timing and synchronicity. Lovely connection there, Hannah. Right. Um, so to your last point, um, so the no shoes thing is really a way of involving the whole body in music. Um, and I know that's that's actually a pedagogical thing in 
in music as well, like with um, Eurythmics, right, as a way of um, having students um, embody the rhythm of what they're uh, what they're learning or listening to. Um, and that's not just for children, but um, but it's a whole system like that that really kind of gets at that. Um, in terms of the repetition, so in her America's Got Talent performance that we saw, she um, she had this song where a, a phrase was repeated over and over again in English, release me, right, release me, release me. And she used a different sign for almost every time she sang that phrase. Um, and that, I mean, you can think about that's an expressive technique, which is really important to interpretation. Um, so like when you're interpreting, you have to get all of this other information in other than lyrics, right? It's really about um, character and vocal quality and vocal practice and all of that. Um, it's an expressive technique. So like, like if you're a singer and you're singing a song that you have a repeat for, uh, you have a re repeated phrase for, which is extremely common um, in classical music, for example, um, your your teacher, your vocal coach will tell you, you know, you can't just sing that the same way each time. It has to mean something different each time. And so that's that's why she's using a different sign each time because it gets at the nuances of the meaning of of what she's saying. So um, if that if that makes sense. Thank um, you so much um and i'm i'm very very sorry i missed when the, the chat feed kept going and i missed charlie's question may i do you have another few minutes yeah. for one more question okay thank you so charlie says i understand why mary harvey doesn't wear shoes on stage to feel the vibrations of the music in order to know where she is within the song does this help with knowing when there is a chord change within the song as well i know that when i was singing on a regular basis listening for when the guitars went to the next chord or when they went up a key was an important part of my own performance. Thank you. Ah, yeah, really interesting. Um, so I, I don't know, because I didn't ask her that. Um, so I don't want to speak for her in any way. But um, but you can, I mean, you know, from your experience, you can, you can feel when pitch changes in a bass line. Um, and so I would imagine that that's, that's part, of, part of the reason um, or part of her practice. Um, if that makes sense, so low frequencies are um, are the best felt by many deaf people. Um, so percussion works really well and bass works really well, um, especially if the sound is like really quite loud. Um, so yeah, so I would imagine that the bass helps with that. Thank you again for giving us even a little bit of extra time. I know you need to run and teach, but um, thank you for really talking with us about how listening and hearing and being heard and, and voice and vocality all work together as you know part of the whole ex experience and expressions of what is the human voice for um, many different people in different places of different backgrounds in this world. Thank you, Dr. Mizell. Thank you, thank and, you so um, much for your questions. Everyone, thank you. Please join me in welcoming or in thanking Dr. Mizell. <laughs> Thanks. All right, you all take care. Thanks so Enjoy much. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, thank Kathy. You. And um, thank you.